Good afternoon and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael. Our program today is one of remembrance and celebration. We are remembering and celebrating the life of Lynn Jarvis, the man who produced this program during four decades. Lynn died on December 29th after battling bone cancer. He was 79 years old. He produced this program from 1975 to 2002, and when he retired, I asked him to be a contributing editor. So for the past 16 years, he's continued to present the monthly editions of In the Kitchen with Across the Fence. He also took his camera with him across the globe and provided us with stories from all seven continents. Lynn began his television career in Alabama back in 1963. He moved back to his home state of Vermont in 1969 to work for what is now known as Vermont Public Television and then to UVM Extension. For Across the Fence's 60th anniversary, I spoke with Lynn about the program, his work, and his favorite topic, you, the viewer. Hello, I'm Lynn Jarvis, and today on Across the Fence, we continue... I would like viewers to know that I've been associated with Across the Fence for 46 right years. It's my maple cream apple pie. Now, just take a look at this. I began my television career in 1969 at Vermont Public Television, and one of my jobs was directing Consumer Hotline that was produced by UVM Extension's Karen Christensen. When she moved on to other things in 1975, Bob Davison, who was director of Extension at that time, called and said, would you like to come to work for Extension and produce Across the Fence? And I said, I would. And so that's how it all started. So Lynn, what does Across the Fence mean to you? Well, for me personally, a viewer response is very gratifying. And when I retired in 2002, I became a contributing editor, uh, doing In the Kitchen with Across the Fence. My next recipe is a viewer recipe. Uh, his name is Bob Crosby, and he lives in Wallingford, and he said it was a favorite recipe This of his lets viewers contact me with their letters because they often send nice little notes when they write for the recipes, and you really get to know them, how the garden is growing, and more serious things like a stay in the hospital or they've lost a husband or wife. And through the years, you really do build up a personal relationship with them, which is something that I enjoy very much. You did good. You want to take a taste of it? Yeah. Go ahead and see I'll what it tastes like. And working with the UVM faculty and staff and the people here at Channel 3, it's been a wonderful, wonderful time and very important to the show. And we don't do just quick sound bites, but detailed information on so many things that viewers are interested in. And we all look forward to that friendly chat across the fence Monday through Friday right after the noontime news and weather. Across the fence was and still is a major part of my life. It was the perfect job for me as I had a master's degree and a bachelor's degree in communications and that training enabled me to work with the fine people at UVM Extension and the creative people here at WCAX TV and it was the perfect mix and the frosting on the cake the positive feedback from all of our loyal viewers, and thank you for watching. Over the years, Lynn worked with a variety of photographers and directors, but his favorite broadcast partner and good friend was Tony Adams. Well, Lynn was so close to me, I, I can't tell you how close, because I worked with him for over 40 years, and when I heard that he had passed away, it was almost like losing a member of my family. I don't have any family up here, they're out of state, and it really shocked me, uh, although I knew it was coming, and uh, that's how close I was to him. I, I felt uh, like a kin. The thing I, I really liked about Lynn was even though it was his show, and he was responsible for getting guests to appear on the show, he was always wide open asking me, you got any suggestions about people? And I would go out in the community and um, somebody would say, you know, you should interview so-and-so. And I'd say, well, what is it about? And they would tell me briefly. And I would tell Lynn. General Howard Coffin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, someone who is And I suggested to him, there are a lot of authors up here who live up here, and I could, 
I read a lot of nonfiction, and uh, would you be interested in interviewing them? And he said, absolutely. The number one thing I would tell people if they ask me about Lynn, I'd say, and I'm not gilding the lily by saying this, but I said, he'll listen to anything you have to say nicely. Some people who uh, uh, are in charge of programs or whatever think, look, I, this is my show and don't put words in my mouth. Lynn would never do that. He would listen to you thoroughly, and if he wanted to do it, he would do it. He was his own guy. That's the thing that really impressed me about the man, yeah. One of a kind. Yeah. Tony and Lynn were, of course, quite the team, but Lynn had other Across the Fence teammates, and one of them is our now current associate producer, Keith Silva. And Keith joins us now in the studio. Lynn was one of the people who had a, a dramatic impact on your career. Absolutely. Lynn hired me for the job. Hired in 95 as a videographer and editor, uh, fresh out of Norwich University. Right. <laughs> uh, at the time, I didn't know very much about Across the Fence or Vermont, for that matter. If it wasn't between uh, Exit 5, the Northfield Exit, and the Burlington Exit, I was a typical college student, so I didn't go to too many other places. Uh, and actually, one of the first shoots we had, uh, Lynn said we were going down Route 7, and I didn't even know there was a Route 7. So uh, it was quite an education. That first so you learned year. about Route 7. <laughs> <So> <laughs> yeah. What else will you remember most about Lynn? Um, the thing I will remember most is uh, just a quick story. About three months into the job, uh, familiar now with Route 7, we were in Danby. Uh, so we're, we're at the Danby Wreath Company, and it's in the Taconic Mountain Range, so it's in this valley. So it, it gets late there early. It's late afternoon. We had about one more sequence to shoot. And uh, we're sitting in Lynn's car. And he turns and says to me, how far is it to Middlebury? And I said, probably an hour, hour and a half. And he goes, oh. And he reaches into his glove compartment. Lynn was a very fastidious person, very important. His appearance was important to him. So he used to carry around an electric razor with him. So he just asked me how long it was to Middlebury. And he turns on the razor, and he starts shaving. And I'm, Classic. <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting there. I'm watching Lynn shave. And uh, he says, oh, well, you know what that means, don't you? And I said, no, what? And he starts shaving again, and he starts singing. And he starts saying, D-O-G-T-E-A-M, the Dog Team Tavern. And he says, we can go to the Dog Team Tavern for dinner uh, and for sticky buns. And uh, that was Lynn uh, to me. That was Lynn. He was dedicated to his job. He's traveling across Vermont and all the while looking for good food. As we celebrate Lynn's life, we want to look back at what made Lynn, Lynn. Food, friends, travel, and of course, Vermont. On this edition of Vermont People in Places, we're going to visit the village of Queechy. Interestingly enough, it's part of the town of Hartford. The but annual series, Vermont People in Places, in is how Lynn shared his love of his home state right with his fellow Vermonters. Jean, we're looking forward to our tour of Sharon. Well, Lynn, it's awfully nice to have you here. It's, it's nice to think that you would uh, come to Sharon and such a beautiful day that you have to be here. Hi, Mary. We just talked to Wes. He gave us a great tour of Randolph, and now we're in the Historical Society Museum. From north to south and east to west, towns, villages, and communities got their time in the spotlight. We've come to Windsor County and the town of Royalton. We've come to Isle Lamont, an island in Lake Champlain. We've come to Wyndham County and the town of Putney. It's a lovely community with a nice mix of agriculture, education, and industry. It became a tradition to end each Vermont people and places with Lynn sampling some of the local fare. You can even stop in here at the Falls General Store and get this grinder that's enough to feed two or three families, wouldn't you think? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it's moxie. And what's it taste like? It's very hard to describe. It's, it was bottled back, I believe, in the 1800s in Maine, and you either love it or you hate it. Mm, I think I could go for it. Oh, it's very it's refreshing on this hot summer day. Speaking of desserts, here's Lynn. <laughs> well, you know I'm a big fan of sweets, and I've heard that Chez Henri makes the best desserts around. And Henri, what do you suggest I try? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to try the crepe Suzette with that climbing thing. And <laughs> be careful, don't burn your mouth. All right, all right. Oh, delicious. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that, 
Mm. Les petits choux à la crème. Petits choux. Oh, les petits choux à la crème. This is uh, mm. typically French. Mm. You know, gooey, gooey uh, crème. And... Très bon. Très bon. Très bon. Très bon. Très bon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for choosing Across the Fence. I'm Will Michael in this afternoon for Judy Simpson, and it is the first Thursday of the month, which means we're in the kitchen with Across the Fence. Lynn loved eating cool as much as he loved cooking, and but what meant the most to him was sharing recipes with Across the Fence viewers. Recipes. It's an apricot cranberry cake, a really nice flavor combination, uh, very nice with sugar, eggs, orange juice, and topped with a glaze that you can see. And uh, Will, I've saved this piece just for you. It's a large size. Uh, yeah, that's the, <laughs> the perfect size, Lynn. You guys definitely have some comforting food today. Uh, my next recipe comes from Mary Stedman up in South Hero. Uh, about 10 of us get together every Sunday, about every Sunday, for a potluck. And she brought this, and we didn't even know it was low-cal because it tastes so delicious. And last month, some of you may remember that I made a cherry a cobbler and Judy suggested that I bring it to the Champlain Valley Fair. Well, I took her advice and you see it on the left with a red ribbon and on the right my maple, apple, blueberry crisp that got a blue ribbon. And I'll just uh, take a little spoonful out so you can see what a nice looking uh, dessert this is. And I have a little whipped cream here and just a little whipped cream on top is really makes a nice treat and I hope you'll try this blue ribbon dessert. Well, congratulations on your fair winnings. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. taking my advice after raising two children. It's refreshing All that right. someone takes my advice <laughs> for a change. When Lynn wasn't in the kitchen, he was often seen on the road, crisscrossing the United States and bringing back stories of his travels. And it's exactly 1,333.5 miles back to Burlington in Vermont. Our last stop was Leopold's Ice Cream, serving Savannah's best ice cream since 1919 and owned by film producer Stratton Leopold. Stratton, in the white shirt, returned to Savannah and reopened the shop in August of 2004, but he continues his illustrious movie career as executive vice president at Paramount Pictures. Seeing one country, or one continent, wasn't enough for Lynn, so he traveled the world. It was across the fence, across the globe. But to the rest of us, Easter Island and beautiful beaches like Copacabana and Ipanema that stretch 12 miles along the coast. They're known as the sexiest beaches in the world because of all the beautiful people that come here. We found a sense of humor at a nearby pastry shop where I ordered a local favorite, Pastel de Fatima. I hadn't ordered coffee, but okay. Oh! <laughs> heart attack, heart attack. <laughs> and after that heart attack, I'm going to enjoy my pastel de Fatima. Mm. Oftentimes, Lynn would bring along friends or family on his adventures. But his closest travel companions were WCAX's Sharon Meyer and videographer and editor Marco Ayala. And they were always game for wherever the road took them. We passed a vendor selling fried crickets, and only Marco was brave enough to sample. Are they still moving? They're actually not bad. Try them. Nope. 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 We're here in Jaipur, and before we tour the city of some three million people, we're going to view it from the 16th century Amber Fort, high above the metropolis. And to get up the hill, guess what? We get to ride one of these elephants. <laughs> It wasn't long until my husband Rainey and I climbed aboard and we're on our way. Okay, wave goodbye. Lynn and Marco Ayella, the video editor for our show today, followed close behind on a 20-year-old elephant named Arnukole. Sabudin is their mahut, or driver of their elephant. Of all the places Lynn went, perhaps the most memorable was his journey to Antarctica, where amongst the penguins and breathtaking beauty of the landscape, Lynn bore witness to a rare sight. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. Tons of ice were slowly rising out of Sierra of a cove.
The force of falling ice created an enormous wave. When we looked back, this is what was left. No one spoke. We had witnessed an awesome and yes, somewhat frightening display of nature's force. It was an exhilarating experience. The Antarctic ice wasn't the only rare sight that day. Lynn Jarvis was there too.